We have the red milkweed beetle. There are actually several uh, different species in North America. They tend not to venture too far from the plant. And you will definitely see them when the milkweed is, is starting to bud out. Um, so you won't see them so much. You may see them other times of the year, but you're definitely going to see them here. Their larvae feed on roots and overwinter, pupate, and emerge the next spring from, from down in there, down in the ground. I think they're just cute. And I feel like I always see them having sex. So, or, you know, whatever. You don't have to say sex. You can say something else. Tender love, making tender love. No, that doesn't work either. Doing their thing. Milkweed tussock moth. I've actually had people tell me, well, geez, I, I bet I shouldn't touch this one, right? Or, um, um, and then again, the same thing, uh, you know, is this species out competing monarchs? Well, if you look there on the right, you know, there are often so many larvae at one time, um, so many eggs that, that, that mama lays that, yeah, they can defoliate some leaves pretty quickly. Uh, but so what? If you have more than one or two milkweed plants in your garden, you're going to be totally fine. Now, these guys are found in the central and eastern U.S. They're, what, they're in stars one through three. They're at the, those are going to be the ones that you find in groups like there on the right. So I'm actually still a little surprised I see so many grouped together there on the right, because by that time, they should be dispersing. Dozens may leave at one time to molt going through those first three instars. So you might say, so So one day, you know, like a Tuesday, you see all these second, first or second instars on your milkweed. Wednesday, there's nobody there. Thursday, everybody's back, but boy, they look a lot different, right? And they overwinter um, in a cocoon and then come out as adults in the spring um, as moths, you know, wings flying around, coming to lay eggs on your milkweed. Anyway, if you touch them, you're fine. You're not going to get stung or something like that. This one, oh my God, I was so excited to see this one last summer out in a prairie uh, nearby. It's the unexpected Cycnia moth. Um, goes by two Latin names. And they're, they're the same, they're synonymous. Um, this guy actually prefers Asclepius tuberosa, but will also be found on other thin-leaved milkweed species. Now, what makes this moth so unexpected is that they won't stray far from a plant or colony and usually stay within just a few hundred yards of where they were born. So they're common only on a very hyper-local level, and that local level is going to be in high-quality habitats. It will overwinter as a cocoon in the leaf litter beneath host plants. So that makes, so if you're burning a prairie and you know you have cycnia, cycnia moss out there, yeah, you're probably going to be killing these guys. Uh, but of course, burning is very beneficial. Their hairs may be black, brown, or cream colored. But I mean, the reason I was so excited to see this is because I know I know that they are they're an indicator species of things, things that are going well, things that are going right in the habitat around them. And they really are unexpected. They are, you know, don't know how else to say it, the common name, beneficial predators. Uh, one's more beneficial than the other, perhaps. Here's green lacewing larva there on the left. If you see that on the milkweed, celebrate, because it's eating aphids. Uh, you may or may not want to celebrate the Harlequin Asian lady beetle um, larva there on the right. It's actually out competing our native ladybugs. Um, so it is, it is a problem. So here you go. Look at those lacewing larvae doing their thing. You can see all those dead black aphids. So yeah, aphids, 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 right? Um, I used to be pretty crazy going out there washing aphids off my milkweed, trying to protect it for, for species that use it as a host plant. I would even mush up those aphids in my fingers and come inside with yellow stained fingers and, you know, probably a little unethical. Stop doing that. Um, don't need to do that. Uh, oleander aphids tend to colonize new leaves and take over quickly. So there are three different aphid species. You're probably most likely going to see the oleander because they're going to be in the midsummer, the high summer. Um, when we're certainly outside the most looking at the garden when their numbers shoot up. I mean, there's just so many of them. Um, if you do have other aphid species, they're just not going to be as many like the milkweed and the green aphid. So now if your garden is healthy, rich, and, and, and has a diverse structure and lots of different plants, the predators are gonna come to your milkweed within days. I mean, literally within days. When I first started gardening with milkweed and, and my ecosystem was not up to snuff, uh, aphids would definitely be there for a week or something. And, and their honeydew was absolutely gonna make the leaves unpalatable because they had a sticky, that sticky substance covering the leaves, that honeydew. Um, so monarchs certainly couldn't use them. 
Um, but once my garden started to fill in, grow in, diversity really got notched up. Uh, literally one, two, maybe three days at most, I was seeing avid populations just nosedive. And these are the pictures I took there on the right, right? So, you know, the ecosystem is working. You can't just have specimens of milkweed around surrounded by a bunch of, by a, by a bunch of mulch. Um, the aphids are going to have a field day. You need to have an entire ecosystem, lots of diversity of plants. And of course we have all kinds of uh, butterfly larva. I found this one out back. No, I didn't. Okay, sorry. All right, one of my personal favorites, purple milkweed, Asclepias purpurescens, part shade, um, probably a medium soil that has more consistent moisture, not wet or damp or anything. Um, I find it does uh, pretty well on sort of like a woodland edge habitat. And a, and a clay soil is fine, so it's moist in the spring, dries out a little bit in the summer, and it's moist again in the fall. Light green central stem. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons I like this is, I know, again, I said I shouldn't do this, but just from a purely aesthetic perspective, looking at these flowers, I mean, they are just so gosh darn vibrant. Yeah, you, you can't even get a sense of how vibrant they are. But the problem is this plant is a little bit finicky about where it grows and how it grows. And it can take some time to establish. So you need to try a plant over here in this part of your landscape, another plant over here in this other part, and just see which one, which one takes. And it'll be a couple of years before you know who's taken. In fact, you may put a plug down in the ground uh, one year and you feel like you don't see anything for a couple of years. And all of a sudden you have this gorgeous flowering plant three or four years later. Um, it's a lot like Baptisia in that way.